This episode continues the conversation I began in the last episode with microbiologist Douglas Axe. We pick up as I ask him about the findings from his study of proteins, whether proteins are able to randomly assemble themselves to reach the final step in the protein creation process, and then hold their shapes long enough to be useful in the invention of new life forms. I know all that sounds very technical. It took me a little while to figure it out, too. But the important thing is to hear what his conclusions are. As I pointed out last time, Dr. Axe is one of the people mentioned by Yale scientist David Galerner in an article he recently wrote entitled Giving Up Darwin, a Fond Farewell to a Brilliant and Beautiful Theory. Galerner says this, quote, Any thoughtful person must ask himself whether scientists today are looking for evidence that bears on Darwin or looking to explain away evidence that contradicts him. There are some of each. Scientists are only human, and their thinking like everyone else's, is colored by emotion. End quote. Last time, as well as this time, Dr. Axe talks about the very human and emotional side of scientists and how it can affect scientific study. You're listening to a small good thing. You're listening to a small good thing. You're listening to a small good thing. Small good thing. Small good thing. Good thing. Small good thing. With Steve Zell. With Steve Zell. So what, what I got from the book and what I'm getting from Gelertner, and he does a very good job, I think, a very good job, basically outlining your work about with proteins. And what I get take away from your book is, and, and it makes sense with the name of the book being undeniable, and that is what it takes to, for, to make proteins, and I'm, I'm going to do this badly, but at the protein level, basically it doesn't survive just the sheer math. The improbability numbers are so high, is it's literally impossible for random chance and mutations and selection and lots and lots of time will produce what we see today. But you've gone down to the almost the basement, and that has to do with proteins, because that's where life is generated, more or less. Uh, and when you figure out the probabilities and the odds, uh, as Gelertner points out, that's impossible. Right. It, the, the number, the math, simply cannot support um, what what the Darwinist, neo-Darwinist claims are. Yeah, and you, if you convey that, uh, which many people have tried to do to an evolutionary biologist, to anyone who's in this club or a student of the club, they will throw up their arms and say, oh, you don't get it, it's not random. Uh, and what they mean by that is mutations might be random, but natural selection is anything but random, they'll say. And right. that's, the, that's why your logic fails. Um, uh, natural selection is weeding out the unfit variants and hone, honing in on the signal that gives you the very best uh, of the best for each gene and each organism. Um, the problem with that <laughs> logic is you can't home in on a signal that is not there. So natural selection only gives you an optimized duck if you started with a duck. It's not going to give you an optimized duck if you started with a worm or a single-celled amoeba. You have to have the thing that's being optimized, the thing that is somewhat fit, in order for natural selection to, among random variants around that somewhat fit form, to give you the more fit form. So you have to have the thing itself. And this is just an obvious flaw. People in Darwin's day uh, threw it back at Darwin in 1859 or shortly thereafter. It was a clear, obvious, um, gaping hole in the theory, and it has never been filled. Um, and, and and if I, and if I, the hole, as I understand it, is uh, it's been... In order for in order for evolution to work on something, there has to be something there. Not only something, there has to be the thing. It so has to be the if, thing if, itself. If evolution is going to make a good widget, mm -hmm. it has to start with a widget that's not good, not or at least yet. it's a widget that right. works as a widget, and right. then it will refine it and make it a better widget. Right. But you can't get a widget out of nothing from evolution, and natural selection does not explain it. And you uh, people have said this till they're blue in the face. I think there's there is a will 
to deny that critique because it's so obviously powerful, undercuts the entire theory. Uh, the title of Darwin's book is On the Origin of Species. So it's not talking about the refinement of species. He claims to have explained an origin. And natural selection starts with something that already has an origin. So it just manifestly does not do what he hoped it would do. Right. There, there's, and I'm not knocking uh, Darwin or natural selection as ideas. There's, there's value to the observations he made with respect to a comparison between natural selection and artificial selection. The thing is, the value caches itself out with something far, far, far more humble than the claims that this is the master blind watchmaker that made everything. It's much, much more humble than that. It's how the new version of the influenza virus escapes our immune systems that caught it last year. It explains that. It doesn't explain... Right doesn't explain the origin of it. Lerner and others, and maybe you too, I don't know, point out that uh, Darwin works very good with uh, microevolution. It explains, well, this sheep got woollier because it was living in this environment, and these finches got different beaks and different camouflage on their thing. It, 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 it explains that, uh, but it does not do a good job at macro uh, evolution, cha explaining how it is that bats became whales or uh, forms, large forms, what Gelertner calls the biggest questions. It doesn't explain the actual big things. It, right. it explains small movements, which... Uh, right, and then the, the sleight of hand is, okay, it, if it explains the small thing and you do that long enough, you get the big thing. But these are categorical distinctions. That's hard We're for people. i got to yeah. tell you, that's hard for people to grasp. Right. It just is. I mean, it's, and I'm just a regular guy. That's hard right. for people because there is a kind of logic to it. Well, look, see all these little tiny things? Yeah. You just add all those little tiny things up and you come up with a big thing. Yeah. It, it doesn't work that way. So if you have a beak and a beak is going to have to have a shape anyway, it's not so hard to believe that you can have modifications that give you slightly more tapered or less tapered version of the beak. But if you have a worm, how are you going to put feathers on the worm? And a, how are you going to give the worm a, a nervous system and... Right you know, uh, feathers and a beak and eyes and all this stuff to make it into a bird. You're not. You're not going to get that by... You're not going to be able to apply that trick of kick it around a little bit and take the slight variant that is a little bit better to the problem of invention, as I call it. How do you get a wholly new thing put together with all the parts that make it work out of nothing? You can't do that with selection. It's impossible. Right. Yes. Now you could say, so I put a number in the 2004 paper to get, or the, the probability of a randomly drawn amino acid sequence producing a particular target function of 1 in 10 to the 77th power, which is roughly 1 in a trillion, 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 trillion. trillion. Now that's impossible um, on all realistic evolutionary scales if you said well what if the universe were you know a trillion 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 years old then you could you could eventually reach a point where okay if the if the universe if we're way off in saying that this is a 12 or 14 billion year old universe if we're way off by you know a hundred orders of magnitude then okay maybe you can get something like that it turns out there are even nobody's saying that though right uh, now if you push people far enough they will say that and the whole um, multiverse cosmology is like the next phase of, okay, um, what if there's an infinite number of universes? Now, now can we solve the problem? But even that doesn't work, and I give a, I give a simple demonstration of how that falls flat in the book. But even that maneuver does not get you out of the problem. There's some other things. Um, basically, if you look at human consciousness, the human mind, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to show that what we're doing right now in thinking and communicating, being conscious, two conscious people interacting with each other, that cannot have, that cannot ultimately be explained as a physical process. We're using physical processes to do this. So vibrating air is how you're hearing me. Um, or we could write down things on paper. So there's all kinds of physical ways that we can, we can leverage physics to communicate 
but the ideas that we're conceiving and the ideas that we're reconstructing on the other end by the by the listener that can't be reduced to physics because if you try to do it you make the whole thing nonsense and everything everything implodes when you get that and i give a very simple argument for that in the book then you realize oh my goodness um, we have physical bodies but we humans cannot be merely physical yes we have a physical component but we have to have something that's sort of riding above the physical component this this spirit mind will thing you're talking about the distinction between the mind and the brain yes and so uh i think it's very easy to show not everyone's willing to acknowledge it but it's very easy to show that the mind cannot be physical it cannot be reduced to the physical it cannot be an epiphenomenon of the physical it has to be its own thing that has its own properties that actually rides over the brain so that's it's my mind that's making me do these words. And yes, I'm using my brain. My brain is sending signals that are moving my mouth, but my mind is in control, not my brain. It has to be that way, otherwise everything implodes. Once you, once you realize that, that we're not physical, we're not just physical, then you have a categorical reason for rejecting any explanation of us that draws simply upon physical causes. And that's exactly what Darwinism does. Darwinism tries to reduce us to physics and chemistry with this selection thing that kicks in once you have the first living cell. And it simply cannot work because physics and chemistry cannot give you something that rides above physics and chemistry. And that's what we are. I want to interrupt here and just say one more thing before we go on. And that is to explain something that has been mentioned before and will be again in this episode. If you haven't already noticed, Dr. Axe is part of a coalition of scientists called Intelligent Design, or ID for short. To state it mildly, ID stirs up strong feelings among traditional, mainstream, scientific, and academic institutions. Here, I only wish to make clear a distinction that is often ignored by the opponents of ID, and that is this, that intelligent design should not be confused with creation science or creationists, as they are called. They are not interchangeable terms. ID and creationism have always differed fundamentally, writes Dr. Axe, in their methods and starting assumptions. Creationism starts with a commitment to a particular understanding of the biblical text of Genesis and aims to reconcile scientific data with that understanding. ID, on the other hand, starts with a commitment to the essential principles of science and shows how those principles ultimately compel us to attribute life to a purposeful inventor, an intelligent designer. That's Dr. Axe. David Galernter, for his part, says this, and I quote, Although I can't accept intelligent design as presented, it does show that it is a plain case of the emperor's new clothes. It says aloud what anyone who ponders biology must think at some point while shifting possible answers to hard questions. Intelligent design never uses religious arguments, draws religious conclusions, or refers to religion in any way. It does underline an obvious but important truth. Darwin's mission was exactly to explain the flagrant appearance of design in nature. Proponents of ID are the dispassionate intellectuals making orderly scientific arguments. End quote. So you mentioned uh, the um, intelligent design. And intelligent design as, uh, as a group has been... Uh, There's a lot of intelligent design haters out there. The animus against intelligent design uh, seems to be the feeling that it's a a Trojan horse. It's trying to sneak God into science. Uh, But uh, Gallertner says, no, that's that's actually not true. That's not what the ID movement is doing. But does intelligent design, does it necessarily have to invo- invoke God? Does it necessarily have to lead to that? Does it? Mm, it doesn't. <clears throat> so there's sort of a, uh, there's a William Dembski, a, a friend of mine, Bill, to me, published a book called The Design Inference, Cambridge University Press. I can't put a year on it. Um, 96, maybe 98. Uh, where it is simply a 
description of an apparatus, a mathematical probabilistic apparatus, apparatus for detecting things that were agent caused. And you could apply this to, um, what's this thing I haven't used yet, turnitin.com or something. So if you're teaching, have I got that right? There's something called turnitin.com for like uh, teachers who are having students write papers Mm -hmm. and they run, they upload all their work or they have the students submit them through something called turnitin.com if I've got the thing right. Um, And it's checking for plagiarism. So it's, it's taking all their writing Right. And it's doing a quick Google or whatever behind the scenes to find uh, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, or worse that have been lifted from some other source. And then the teacher can decide, well, was this a quote? So it's okay if you've quoted a paragraph from right. this person. But if you're pretending that this is your work and it's not your work, then you're in trouble. So that is a design inference because the assumption is two people cannot independently construct uh, you know, a hundred words paragraph that is word for word identical. That just can't happen. If two people turn in uh, papers that are identical at that level, then there was collusion. <laughs> they either got it from the same source right. or one of them stole it. Was it, it random it. chance? Right. It can't be chance. That is, the logic behind that is called the design inference. So by design, someone intentionally did this and therefore you can call them on it and say explain yourself you're here here are the two essays this paragraph is identical on both of them i need you two people to explain this it can't they can't say well i mean we just think alike great minds think alike nobody can explain it that way it has to be common source Uh, it has to be design in this case so there is there's this apparatus that can be used for all kinds of things it can be used for you know insurance purposes it can be used to detect um this kind of plagiarism um, uh, it's design inferences are used in uh, crime investigations. They can also be applied to uh, the natural world in order to say what sort of uh, arrangements of matter would, if they exist out there, uh, legitimately lead us to infer that someone deliberately did this arrangement. And then you can apply that to Stonehenge and say, you know, rocks do things that rocks do, but they don't do this. So someone did this. The Rosetta Stone. Um, you can get lines carved in rocks by wind and erosion. You can't get this. Someone did this. And you can apply, interestingly, to the butterfly that the four-year-old looks at and says, this was made by a godlike designer, and come to the same conclusion that the four-year-old did and say, this cannot, this cannot have happened by chance. Someone has to have intended for this. To well, be I guess that's the beef. In other words, if someone says uh, starts talking about intelligent design, it implies an intelligent designer. Yes. And the designer then seems to be yes. God. Yeah. And scientists say no. There's, it, it. So my question is, well, maybe I can come around on it this way. Are there people uh, in your field, scientists, researchers, who are uh, uh, Darwin doubters? And saying and agreeing with your your ideas, but they themselves are not uh, believers in God. They they don't they don't actually think there is a God, but by the same token, they don't think the Darwinian explanation is sufficient. Are there people out there like that? Yes, but there, it's a rare it's a it's a rare group. I extensively refer to Thomas Nagel mm-hmm. as one example of this. So he's an atheist. Mm-hmm. He authored a book. Oxford University Press called Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. So he is an atheist who rejects Darwinism. Mm -hmm. He has read work from intelligent design proponents, and he says, I find it convincing. There's no way that this can explain life. But I don't want to invoke God as an explanation for life or the universe. And he's very candid about the fact that it's not it's not a rational um, deduction that leads him to conclude that God doesn't exist. He says, it's, it's, it's my desire that God not be there. He, he's looking, so he's a philosopher of mind. Yeah. And he's been driven to, this, to the rejection of materialist uh, physicalism, the mm-hmm. idea that there is nothing but matter and energy, space and time, mm-hmm. by his um, 
astute observations with regard to the human intellect. So uh, con the things that we've spoken about, consciousness, cognition, right. and moral sense, he says, cannot be had from the elements on the periodic table. Right. They, they have to have drawn from something that is outside of physics. Therefore, all of reality has to be bigger than physics. Um, therefore, I'm not a materialist. I'm speaking as though I'm Thomas Nagel. Not a materialist, not a physicalist, not a Darwin, Darwinist. But he does call himself a naturalist. He wants nature. He wants, In other words, he wants there to be a bigger version of nature that includes mind and consciousness or some drive mm -hmm. toward mental activity and consciousness as part of what is. And he does not want... He wants the solution to be within the universe, not outside the universe. Because outside the universe means God. Inside the universe means some sort of naturalism that includes consciousness and mental activity within it. So, Galerter, he says, um, the difficulty with intelligent design, he says there are some difficulties with it. And uh, I'll, I'll just read it a little bit here. And here he's talking about Meyer's work because he... Uh, he depends heavily on Meyer. And uh, he says, uh, if Meyer work were invoking a single intervention by an intelligent designer at the invention of life or of consciousness or rationality of self-aware consciousness, the idea might seem more natural. But when an intelligent designer who interferes repeatedly, on the other hand, poses an even harder problem of explaining why he chose to act the way he did, when a cause would such a cause would necessarily have some sense of the big picture of life on earth what was his strategy how did he manage to back himself into so many corners wasting energy on so many doomed organisms granted they might each have contributed genes to our common stockpile but could hardly have done so in the most efficient way what was his purpose and why did he do such an awfully slipshod job why are we so disease prone heartbreak prone and so on an intelligent designer makes perfect sense in the abstract the real challenge is how to fit this designer into life as we know it intelligent design might well be the ultimate answer but as a theory it would seem to have a long way to go. And what he's sort of saying there is very, an ancient question. He's going, well, if God created the world, why is it all messed up? So that's an old, 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 old question, which right. lots of people, lots of lots of smart guys have answered, at least made it a gesture towards an answer. I don't know that it can be ultimately explained, but it certainly can be explained. But then he goes on and he says this. Here's what's interesting about him. He says, uh, I might myself expect to find the answer in a phenomenon that acts as if it were a new and thus far unknown force or field associated with consciousness. I'd expect complex biochemistry to be consistently biased in the direction that leads closer to consciousness as gravitation biases motion towards massive objects. I have no evidence for this idea. It's just the way biology seems to work. Now, I'm not exactly sure what he means by that, but it, again, it, it wants to nod towards this idea of consciousness. And, uh, a, and a popular proponent of this idea is Jordan Peterson. One of the attractive features about Peterson is that he takes the Bible and the Bible's stories seriously and sees deep meaning in them. In fact, he sees them as true. He says, nothing could be more true than these. And these stories, he said, have evolved over millions and millions of years of a development of evolutionary psychology, evolutionary, whatever you want to call it, consciousness, the development of consciousness. And they came out as stories. That's the first place where they come out, is these deep stories which are true. And, and, and Peterson is not particularly antagonistic to the idea of God. He doesn't no. say that. But he doesn't uh, found it or, 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 or bolt that down to uh, a, a revelation or anything, but rather this kind of biological development of consciousness. And that seems to be what Galerter is doing here. It, yeah, in some respects, um, 
I haven't interacted with him on this, but from what you read, it sounds like it might resonate with what Thomas Nagel is looking for. So that's Nagel why I said. Says, that's why yeah. I said it. Yeah. So Nagel saying um, we have to come up with a version of nature that has this natural push towards yes. higher level conscious faculties, because here we are, and yet we don't want to deny nature. Now, um, what Galerncher is saying, he has no evidence for it, but he suspects this is it, that there's something in biology that pushes toward consciousness. Sounds like, sounds like that would be what Nagel is pushing for as well. In your wide reading, are, are there fellows who, are there writers who, um, who uh, subscribe to the Darwinian uh, establishment scientific narrative, but uh, seem to be thoughtful and of goodwill and, and, and display some humility? Let me say it to you that way. There seems to be precious little humility going on in some of this stuff. Mm. Are there, have you read any fellows out there? Um, I, I, I have not read any, but the name uh, Stephen J. Gold always comes into my mind. Is, is he a writer? Or are there other writers that you, that you admire, at least for intellectual humility out there? Well, he was, the late Stephen J. Gould was a great uh, thinker, and he had some, he was a great writer. So there's uh, lots of brilliance out there among people that I, passionately disagree with on a number of things. I'm not, I'm not saying that anyone's dumb if they deny God or uh, accept Darwin and think that Darwin's theory works. They're certainly not. There's a lot of very, very bright people there and good communicators. And even Dawkins, I would say, is a great communicator. When he wants to be, he gets too shrill at times. But when he was more calm, he's a very good communicator. Um, it's become harder to see people of goodwill who approach this with humility because the to the extent that the some debates can become so polarized that they become poisoned and it's very hard for someone to enter it anew with fresh eyes and not um if they come down on either side, they're going to get lambasted by the other side. <laughs> and so they either have to be callous or they have to, um, or they very quickly withdraw and, and don't say anything more. That's regrettably what happens when a debate has reached a point where um, it hasn't resolved itself in that one side has fully conceded, um, but neither has it shown a willingness to continue the debate? And I, I can give my interpretation here. I mean, I would like to think that I'm being very open. I've invited conversation with people who disagree with me, and I've tried to be very, um, you know, humble and respectful in how I conduct that kind of conversation. There's a guy named Hans Vader. I've had a two-year online conversation with him. He's Say his name again. Hans Vader, V-O-D-D-E-R. It's, it's published online at Evolution news and we don't agree we started off not agreeing and it's been a very respectful dialogue so there are these good examples of it but it's regrettably hard and it becomes very hard if you're in the academy and you're gonna um, suffer for taking a position that is um, thoroughly disapproved of by your peers and that that makes it hard. It, it's sort of ironic that the academy is supposed to be the place where you can have these high-level discussions and no one is um, all carefully thought through views are welcome. This is what the academy should be. It just isn't because the academy becomes this club where it just does not want to countenance certain ideas. And so if that's your idea, get out. Or And, and in my view... Part of why this has become sort of uh, a bitter debate is the very smart, very capable people um, who are on the Darwinian materialist physicalist side know that they've lost in terms of the intellectual. Okay, but now you're going to have to you're going to have to justify that. How do we how do we know that they know that they've lost? I, I'm not saying no. I'm saying this is my. This is my account of why it becomes so bitter 
is because if you are a very smart, very capable, very accomplished person who's spewing nonsense and you know you're spewing nonsense, there isn't a graceful way to... You either concede and stop spewing nonsense or you become pretty bitter in your, uh, in your treatment of the people who are, who are calling you out for it. I, I think that's... I think that's where we are, and of course, I don't expect people. You know, people won't agree with me on that if they're on the other side. But I think that accounts for why it is not. You won't find a Darwinist who graciously agrees to take the stage with uh, design proponents and really wants to wrestle this through and get to the bottom. I've done wrestling with a number of people, and they reach a point where they don't have an answer, and at that point. You either have to concede defeat, which none of these people want to do, um, or you turn off the <laughs> microphone. You just don't want the talk to go on. And I think that's what we're seeing. Here's Galertner again. Meyer and other proponents of ID, that is um, intelligent design, are dispassionate intellectuals, that's his claim, making orderly scientific arguments. Some ID haters have shown themselves willing to use any argument, fair or not, true or not, ad hominem or not, to keep this dangerous idea locked in a box forever. They remind us of the extent to which Darwinism is no longer just a scientific theory, but the basis of a worldview and an emergency replacement religion for the many troubled souls who need one. Yeah, I think that's... I think he hit the nail on the head there that that there's um, this touches on something that's beyond intellectual that becomes a worldview issue, a spiritual issue, if you will, um, and when you're clashing at that level, um, people perceive there to be too much at stake to concede. People don't easily change their mind on something like that. Yes, you can change your mind on a simple scientific fact. Uh, but this is way beyond that. And people don't easily change positions on that. Before I finish up talking to Dr. Axe, I wanted to tell you that on the next show, I get to speak with Dr. William Marsh. That's Dr. Marsh to you, but to me, he's just Billy. My friend Billy Marsh holds degrees in theology, Near Eastern languages and civilizations, and philosophy of religion. This and more makes him exactly the person I want to talk to about one of the most beautiful and disturbing books in the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of Ecclesiastes. That's next time on A Small Good Thing. Changing gears, uh, uh, what one thing would you say to my religious listeners who maybe have children, or maybe they're just thinking about it? What, what, is, what is one message, just one, one message that you want to say to Christians, Jews, uh, perhaps even Muslims, those of those who take God seriously, what what would you want to say to them um, about this whole thing? Well, I start my book with this idea that the four-year-olds, I quoted Alison Gopnik, that, that kids see God when they see the things that God has made. And I end my book saying, um, you know what, they were right. Um, so I think that that's the one message. Don't lose heart just because it seems like powerful forces are telling you that your faith is in vain. Um, go back to the things that are very simple and very pure and take heart. I think that's the one message. And then I have, I don't know who listens, but I think I have some people who are not believers, mm -hmm. um, but they're people of goodwill. They like me mm -hmm. and they at least, maybe they listen. What, what one thing would you want to say to those people? I would say, um, um, I think I would say to those people, um, be, push yourself to read beyond Wikipedia. I'm not saying you do, but there's all these caricatures. Don't read caricatures of your opponents. Read your opponents. That's what I would say. Read deeply the people who are saying the things that your circles are vilifying and don't be content to have your friends say, don't read that junk. If it's the best work that's coming from a design perspective, go read it firsthand and 
keep an open mind. And I think I certainly invite in my book, I invite atheists and agnostics to come along for the ride. And I'm thrilled when they do. And I know it doesn't automatically convert an atheist into a theist to read it, but it's the beginning of a conversation that I think is, is very healthy. Shortly after finishing our talk, Dr. Axe was picking up and moving his family to Los Angeles, where he will take up the duties of the Maxwell Chair of Molecular Biology at Biola University. If you're the kind of person who prefers to read and think for themselves, a good place as any is to begin with Dr. Axe's book, Undeniable, published by HarperCollins. Also, if you would like to see for yourself exactly what it is that proteins do, check out the incredible three-and-a-half-minute video that I've linked in the show notes. Thank you.